They're a huge bigs team. They're strong. They're fit. They're tough. They're hard as nails. They're hard working. They have a fetching midfielder who is brilliant on the ground. They have scoring forwards. They have scoring forwards that can win their own ball. They have load of pace all over the field. They have tight marking defenders, attacking half backs. They have a running game. They have a kicking game. They're the best goalkeeper in the country. Like you could go on forever. The GA Hour is sponsored by Paddy Power. Money back as a free bet on any championship match on live TV. If you're losing first goal scorer, bet gets a goal. I'm not finished yet, it took me a long time to get here. What a game in Croke Park, lads, yesterday. I was absolutely looking forward to coming into work um, to talk about this. It was like a hurling game. It was just like score after score. It was a roller coaster. One team would go ahead to be pegged back, the other team would go ahead. Level 16 times, only three wides in the entire second half. I was just thinking, like, I mean, when these top, very top level players have any space at all, that's the level that these lads are at. They're not used to it, but when they get it, you know, Langan, Gallen, Clifford, you know, McGinney, all these very, very top level players able to kick scores when they get the space to kick them. And absolute credit has to go to Donegal because we, we knew Kerry were going to come out and play like this. I didn't think Donegal would. I absolutely didn't. They manned up all over the field. And even when both teams, the odd time, did have players back, the other team was pushed so far up on them. There was no zonal players. Only McFadden, I think, in the whole game was able to cover space. And Splan didn't follow him in. He stayed around the midfield. He didn't even drop back. Like, it was an incredibly attacking game of football. And... The atmosphere, 48,000 people, some people say Croke Park isn't good for atmosphere. It is when it's a bloody good game. Yeah. Like a lot of the problem here with Croke Park is they're shite games. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? This was just brilliant. You can't, there's nothing more, you just can't talk about this game enough. No, you can't. Well, I, I suppose what uh, gives it the ringing endorsement from my side of things is that I was after watching the two games on the Saturday night, well, part of the Dublin Roscommon yeah. game, uh, I had... Watch but the no, that's not Dublin's game. fault. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Apologies to Dublin fans. Yeah. But, uh, you know, after watching the Mead game, usually you'd try and head off. You wouldn't have much interest. But, you know, you, you hang around and watch the first 10 or 15, 20 minutes and see what's happening. But you were there right to the bitter end and you actually wanted more. You were nearly hoping, geez, it'd be great if this could go to extra time. Like it was a proper game of football. Yeah. Two teams going hell for leather at it, chasing down victory. And it was just, there was so many things. Actually, the... The bit of rain actually added to the game as well. I often think that games played where there's a, a bit of a spill of rain and because it just means that there, there's a little bit more of a lottery element to it. Handling is more difficult. There's more turnovers in possession. It's just, it makes it more of a spectacle. And um, yeah, look, that that's the game of the championship so far by a long, long way. Oh yeah, by a long, long way. Declan Bonner said it was some match, no doubt about it. Both teams went at it and I think at the end of the day a draw was probably a fair result. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I could, I would have been heartbroken for either of those two teams <laughs> whoever would have lost it. They didn't deserve to lose it. You know, they, yeah. both, they both had chances, goal chances. Jesus, oh McHugh throwing the ball in. What was he thinking? Now, we uh, joke about players doing that all the time. I think, he it, made I it think so it's your obvious. fault, Wally. I think the referee uh, would have been allowed uh, he caught it. I know, but campaign. This, this wasn't even borderline here, no. lads. He caught the bloody yeah. thing and threw it in. But I thought it was catching on because of Michael Darren McCauley's then Kyle McShane did that big bat as well where he just absolutely smashed it in and then Owen McHugh catches and, it. Jeez, McHugh was a bit unlucky because I don't know what Donegal player was in front of him but the, the Donegal Brennan, player in front yeah. of him just got a Flat touch better. on the ball mm. and if he hadn't touched it at all it would McHugh it just took it away from McHugh slightly. A little bit unlucky but a butchered opportunity you know in, in that uh, in that type of a game yeah definitely was and interestingly the Donegal management after the game when the full time whistle went they all hugged each other you know what I mean they were delighted I think look I don't want to be too critical it was a natural reaction for saving the game and it was such a, an emotional you know roller coaster of a game but like I mean Mayo could easily you know put them out next week yeah. you know or two weeks time which is you know which is, is a weird one too considering how poor Mayo were in the first game yeah and like that that point actually d- changes nothing for Donegal now they still have a shootout against Mayo like you know if Kerry had a one Donegal were a shootout against Mayo and if they drew Donegal were a shootout against Mayo but if Mayo, Donegal had won they were uh, yeah if Don- well if Donegal had won they were practically true because no, Mayo no but, so but them hugging celebrating the draw oh, yeah. it didn't change no anything. it didn't change much I think they just got carried away in the game I don't want to be too um, critical of it but I just thought it was interesting that they were all hugging um, down below me in the press box Peter Kane said after the match I thought we fought like hell towards the end there was a never say die attitude by us and I thought there were a couple of frees went against us that were bordering on not being frees now there were a couple of very soft frees I thought and the only reason I'm pointing out 
these freezes because I thought it was brilliant defending. Jason Foley foul on Gallon where he was up beside him, punched the ball away and was, f- and was blown for pushing him in the back. It was not. It was just brilliant yeah, man on man defending. And Spillane on Murphy, nearly exactly identical thing was blown for a foul where he was just tenaciously getting up to fist the ball away. They were two that stood out for me. Keane didn't think it was a penalty when it was a stonewall penalty. Like, I don't know what he was looking at there. Like, I mean, Stephen O'Brien on Darrow Bwale. Does it not get any more blatant a penalty than that? Yeah, and it was interesting. I, I, at the time, I thought oh, it has to be maybe even a black card for Stephen O'Brien, but it happened very fast. I, I don't think he intentionally went in to take him out, but it was without a doubt it was a penalty. Like, and... Um, you know, on another day, O'Brien could have picked up a yellow card for it just because of the ferocity at which he, he collided with O'Brien and he picked up a yellow card um, not long after that again when he when he resumed play. So, um, yeah, absolutely a penalty. I don't know what he... Yeah, did. definitely was. And technically, the two black cards were black cards too. Now, I'm on the kind of line of when it's such a great game like I'm wrong what I'm saying here because I just was so looking forward to Gavin White versus McHugh because yeah. the, the battle had started so well McHugh was clean and white but White was giving McHugh loads to think about as well going the other way and I was thinking geez this is fantastic it's almost like a you could watch these two the whole game without watching anything else and then White got to black and let's be honest it was a black it was stupid he didn't need to pull him down with him and then Donnelly I think that wasn't I think that was very harsh black that was a f- spur the moment thing and sometimes when you go to tackle someone you might put your feet out and your arms out like he did trip over his leg but I don't think it happened so fast I would be a lot more sympathetic to Donnelly than than White oh yeah totally yeah um the Gavin White one he was he was already pulling out of McHugh you know pulling his jersey and then he kind of tripped up and he 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 could have got away with it if he just let go of the jersey yeah he would have got away with it just being a clumsy tackle but it was it was a it was a fairly obvious black card i think o'donnell can count himself very unlucky um it's probably oh, one of those right. where the referee was just trying to even it up after giving oh, he the was. black card. Like the minute I, mean, I saw it, I was yeah, saying, like he's it gone. was it he's was gone. A, it was a clumsy foul, but there's absolutely no way it was a deliberate trip with the foot. No, absolutely not. But in a in a weird way, it actually worked out so well for Donegal because Gallon came on was outstanding yeah. in the second half. O'Donnell was doing really well. Yeah, too. O'Donnell was O'Donnell. doing well. He was yeah. doing he was well. Good, yeah, good player. But he gave, but O'Donnell was doing well around the, the middle third. Gallon offered something completely different because Jimmy Brennan wasn't getting much change out of Thomas Sullivan. We'll talk about that again. I want to talk about the, the Jason Foley, Michael Murphy um, thing where Foley pulled out of that, lads. In a way, I don't blame him. Now, I, I abhor pulling out of tackles, <laughs> but I think Michael Murphy could have ended his life if they had, <laughs> if they had him connected there. But Foley absolutely pulled out of that. Yeah, well, we were laughing at, it, uh, at the time because it was... Uh, it was the only contact was a glancing blow from Michael Murphy. There was the fellow beside it. me says, yeah, well, a glancing blow from Michael Murphy <laughs> is more than enough. So, yeah. uh, but Maybe Fo- Foley's very quick. He didn't, uh, he, he possibly will regret that he could have moved quicker out of Michael Murphy's way. Yeah, uh, but that was the thing and he went down just by the slightest touch. Imagine if that was a, that, Jesus, Murphy's coming at him. Uh, he, was com- he was coming like a train there. Yeah. And what happened there was Murphy was so annoyed that he didn't get to take him out. He left the elbow kind of up, you know, to get something on him. Do you know that kind of way? And, and, maybe Foley got it in the back but he absolutely wanted no part of that and I can understand why but Lee, well, you, you always know when a lad is really throwing everything at him because Murphy even after the contact l- went about five <laughs> yards past Foley and landed on all l- you know landed on the ground himself you know usually if a guy is setting himself for a, a shoulder challenge that doesn't end up so he was throwing full bodied at him so oh, he was. But Foley, Foley in, in hindsight his, uh, his season isn't over, so maybe he took the right course of action. <laughs> he lives to fight another day. Um, Murphy robbed a load of yardage for the last three. <sighs> now, like, I mean, that was obvious. I was sent a screenshot of where he took it from, the very top of the D and where the foul occurred, which was maybe seven yards further out. Yeah. Now, Murphy's still, he's a clutch player. I know he missed an easy one in the first half. He's still going to score it, but that's not the point. They're getting away with robbing off the hands, robbing outrageous amount of yardage. I remember or what the solution to this is, is I wouldn't see anything wrong with the white spray they use in the soccer. Yeah. What would be wrong with that? I remember Chris Conway for Leash used to have a huge, elaborate uh, free-taking routine. I and remember the well, of, yeah. The amount of yards he'd rob. But Chris would be fierce, clever about it. He'd always say to the referee, he'd make a mark with his foot in the ground and say, here, ref. And yeah. the ref would say, yeah, as in this is a very honest chap altogether. Yeah. And then Conway would be in way ahead of it by the yeah. time he actually goes to kick it. Yeah, well, it's a skill in itself. Well, we don't <laughs> yeah. That's exactly 
exactly what O'Connor and Dean Rock do as well. They plant their foot down to say, I'm taking it from here. But then Sir O'Connor's routine is so extravagant. He's walking in all different directions. You forget yeah. where he's planted Oh, his you foot. do, yeah. Yeah, because the grass goes down briefly, but then it just starts <laughs> yeah. popping back. <laughs> you haven't made a divot or anything? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. I think the spray, I wouldn't see anything wrong yeah. with the spray. And it's just very quick. It, there's no problem with the in the soccer at all. There's your mark. Don't go over it and that's it. Yeah, because Dean Rock is very clever actually on Saturday. He was out on the right-hand side and instead of gaining yards in he sort yes. of took yards inside towards the post yeah yeah the left a bit. yeah i mean look at it it's it's the oldest trick in the book i mean for for many free takers who do it it's it's make the mark and try and uh, you've seen it over the years but i mean murphy probably stole three or four yards there dean rock does it the whole time killian o'connor does it i mean yeah. everyone's at it yeah but don't look, hate it, the player hate the game yeah but look it's ultimately the same people say oh it's kicking them out of, out of the hands but sure, every every player comes up who takes it off the ground. There's always the big forward reach yeah. where they steal another yard or two <laughs> as well. So I mean, look, it's just one of those things. I mean, um, it's it, it's something that I would consider to be kind of clever play. And it's up to the officials to, like you say, mm. that's probably not a bad idea. That it's a bit of a spray. It's yeah, I think the spray would look, keep it fairly clear cut. Keep it fairly clear. This, listen, this isn't a huge drama or anything because it has been going on for donkey's ears. And you're right, off the ground they still robbed them too. So. Um, was an interesting one did you notice this lads you're at the game that Donegal were in mid warm up as the national anthem came on did you see that going on I thought it was weird that Donegal usually their warm up routine something must have happened with Donegal because these are down to a tee now you know everything's timed and you're done they were all in bibs standing for national anthem because they actually just had to abandon their warm up and I was thinking something must have happened with their bus or something must have although they were in well, for the match beforehand I, I, I so. don't know it's quite strange because nearly as soon as the Mead and Mayo game finished the teams were before the Mead and Mayo were off the pitch the other two teams were Came sprinted onto the pitch yeah, yeah. so I, I, that was a surprise to me so unless the Mead Mayo match had dragged on I know there was probably 78 went to 7 there was about 8 minutes of injury time in the second half maybe there was a delayed half time although I didn't think it I thought half time in the in the in the second match seemed to last definitely the full pro- probably lasted about 20 minutes as opposed to maybe the 15 or whatever is supposed to be allocated to yeah. it but, but it was definitely unusual at that yeah, top was, level yeah. you don't, ne- you don't you never reg- see them very rarely the yeah. down tools in a warm up in Crook Park <laughs> like I mean it was bizarre like it's the logistics of that is down to a fine art that they're moving from one to another the tracksuits come off I'd say it's just all so planned out and I was thinking geez, maybe Donegal might get off to a bad start here that they're you know maybe a little bit over, all over the place but they didn't although in the first half I think they were hanging on to a certain extent that Kerry were missing chances but we'll talk about that in the second half Cork good showing you know Ronan McCarthy said they didn't want any moral victories they didn't want to talk about progress he, t- he said they'd thrown away another game that they were in a great position in and they did like they did, they had Tyrone there for the taking and, you know, second half Tyrone, well, I suppose Tyrone deserves some credit as well for changing it in the second half, putting Donnelly in there and maybe going for it a little bit more. But this is all about Cork's goal chances. Um, Connolly had the chance, he tried it soccer style. Now, I wouldn't be too critical of that because it was a bad pass to him and he had to take it. Um, I think he was a very good soccer player as well although I think he was a centre half so that was a bit more <laughs> like that finish of a centre half Michael Hurley had a great goal chance that he fisted over the bar we know we're giving out here about fisting over the bar take your goal there your corner forward it's very important getting a goal getting a goal chance in Crow Park is few and far between in your career rattle it rattle it and it turned out to be a massively important game they lo- po- scored they lost by two points that would have made it a draw because obviously you'd cancel out the, the actual fisted over point. But he played really well when he came on. But like, I mean, it's those, it's those things. Another one, Sean White, bearing down on goals at the start of the second half. Connolly inside him. Inside yeah, that, him. That was the real that was un- one for But me, that was yeah. unforgivable now yeah, from my point of view agree. because you often see, oh, he didn't give it in and you say, Jesus, sorry, I didn't see your support run just coming from behind me and it was that split second. He was right in his line of vision. And this is Connolly, an out and out finisher. And White goes in and blasts it over the bar. Won't give it to the out and out finisher to score a goal. Cork only have themselves to blame there. They had the chances to win that game. Yeah, they had the chances to just keep their noses in front. Tyrone started kind of, you know, really well in the second half. And you would have to say that, you know, that you'd have to call into question why it took them so long to make the changes that they did in terms of their tactics. Because sitting back off Cork and allowing Cork to have the slow methodical build up wasn't good because Cork liked to run the ball anyway. You know, if you're if you're to go man to man with Cork and put put a bit of pressure on them and try and suffocate them in their own half, as they did a little bit more in the second half, they reaped the benefits of it. Um, but Cork had their opportunities, and when you're the underdog, 
you have to make the most of all of those chances, particularly when you're playing against like a really top team. You know, at this stage yeah, of the season, no, you, you have to make you have to make all of them count. But even the Lockery goal, I'm not going to even give him credit for that. It was a brilliant finish, but like I mean, that's not a percentage finish. He had Col- Mark Collins, yeah. his full forward inside him as well. He chose not to. This is a cornerback now. He he's a wing back as well. But my God, like Cork were taking the wrong options there. It was more like I want to get onto the scoreboard, and at that very top level that's not you know good enough and it wasn't good enough yeah and like I, I do sort of come back to what Keane said about I would still look at Mickey Hart and why did they take so long to make that change because when you saw Matty Donnelly against Flahev for most of the half then oh yeah he ran him up in the second half how is this yeah. still like how is he still being mad marked by him like you know and Mickey Hart should know that that, that that could be a mismatch that sort of you know trans that, that sort of comes out when you like do your lineup, but he hasn't seemed to think that way. He thinks we've got this way of playing and we'll keep playing yeah. that way rather than thinking nobody there going to mark Matt Donnelly. I have to say this year has kind of you know shone a light on the fact that that counter attack isn't as effective yeah. as it used to be. Like even I made the point during the game, like Cork were one of the ta- more tactically unastute is that a word uh, teams. And they still, they played, the, your man, um, Sean White played the Kieran Kilkenny role of just over and back, methodical, and try and drag them out of place. And every team is doing that now. You know, you're not getting that joy out. Of, that game plan has had its day. It was unbelievably successful for Donegal won in All-Ireland with it. Tyrone were excellent at it for a few years. It's, you're not getting the return out of it anymore. And for loads of reasons, and we mentioned last Thursday, teams won't give you the turnovers. When they do give you the turnovers, they're working like dogs to get back. You're not outworking teams on that counter anymore. They're just too smart at it. Look at Kerry and Donegal. Like, it was unreal. They didn't worry at all about a sweeper. It's just if, if the move broke down, they're, what they're actually using the move breaking down, they're using that as an opportunity to turn them back over again. Do you know what I mean? Whereas it used to be, all oh, drop my head. Oh, shit, we lost the ball. And before you know it, a, ca- a sweep and counterattack. Now if it's turned over, so many men are already up there it's like okay, we've lost it. Let's get it back and <laughs> yeah. get a score. Well, like the, there is, there's an obvious contrast between teams in in the line that they draw, of where they start their start their kind of pressing and tackling. Tyrone were against Cork were inside their own forty five yeah. almost. I mean, that's just too deep. Now we don't want to be too critical, though, King, because this destroyed Cork last year. So, no, like, I mean, I wouldn't be critical of Tyrone going out with those tactics. And I, ne- I know you're saying they were oh, well, too ca- late before they changed them, but they d- at least they did change. Ah, them, yeah. You know? Look, at, uh, I mean. <laughs> I, I would I would say that they they were too passive. It was too deep to be trying to press them like inside their own forty five. When they know what Cork have to offer, they could like I can understand why you might play pl- play that way for maybe the first ten or fifteen minutes and say let's not give these lads any oxygen. But they conceded the goal after five you know thirty seconds, so maybe they sit tight then for the next ten minutes and say okay let's kill the let's kill this here. Let's take the oxygen off Cork. Let's play our usual game. But then it was fairly obvious that Cork weren't going to give them that opportunity. Cork were good. They're good ball carriers. Their offloads were really good. They were cutting Tyrone open a lot. Yeah. So um, Tyrone at that stage needed to kind of say, well, OK, le- how can we hurt Cork a little bit more? How can we change it up? And to me, Dublin would, if things were going wrong for Dublin, they would not have waited that long to make the change. They would not have waited a full half of football before they started making changes that to, to their approach yeah and that's just that to me is fairly obvious yeah no and uh, to be fair you're you're probably i would be more in the line of some well some managers might not make the change at all well they should but the donnelly going in it's not like they hadn't tried this before yeah. and it's a pretty easy quick kind of change you know for it but uh, maybe they needed the half time uh to regroup sky have us have an obsession with possession stats so like Sean White's had 34 possessions in the first 36 minutes and like they're eulogising about this. It's like Kieran Kilkenny against Donegal a few years ago. He's taken one twos. These aren't hard won possessions. It's not real life. Possessions in a game like that mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. Yeah, It's, it's a role or a function that's fulfilled and it's something that can, you know, sometimes in a game somebody just wants somebody to take the ball off them and somebody can link the play and do all those nice things. It works if you're winning in a game and you want to control the tempo of the game. That's where it's an important role and you're challenging the opposition then to come, to, out. To yeah. come out and somebody to, to man up on you and that opens a gap somewhere else. But when you're behind, look, it it, it was a it was a reasonable, it was a very good role for him to play in the game against Tyrone with the way Tyrone were playing. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, but ultimately, the, the 
quality of what he was doing a lot of the time was absolutely perfect in that particular game. But in a lot of matches, for example, when Mead played against Mayo at the weekend, Mead had a number of players that were performing the same kind of function, but they weren't having any impact on the game because it was a different type of match and Mead needed scores. That's when you need your half forward in a half forward position, making that hard run to link the play, as opposed to dropping back into your half back line and getting handy ball. Yeah, handy ball. They're not real possessions. I would discount them immediately. See Colin Cavanagh get the early yellow, lads. Yeah. No curly finger for Colin Cavanagh. <laughs> so maybe this is thrown out the window. Or well, we obviously know it's one rule for certain players, yeah. and then <laughs> other players can get can get away with it. So the curse is over for Mayo. They beat Mead for the first time in the championship since 1951. That's when they won the All Ireland um, in the final. Uh, me or Mayo were very poor in the game for most of it. Twenty minutes to go, they were two points down, and Killian O'Sullivan, who for me just flatters to deceive a little bit, he's just not firing at all. Like he's missing easy chances that he shouldn't be missing. He had a great easy chance, and that would have put them three up um, with maybe fifteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen minutes to go. And you would have thought Mead. I was thinking Mayo were going out of the championship at that time because. We have a live show in Westport next Thursday week and I was thinking, geez, we'll be moving this to Navin now, <laughs> which was my backup, which was my backup plan. But like, I suppose, same problem for Mead. I think Mead's problem, Keen, is that they bloody, they run out of steam because they run the ball too much through the game. They have no kicking game. And I thought in the league final against Mead, they had a kicking game. They have no kicking game. They run everything and it's energy sapping and it's killing. Conlon's too small. Newman's movement's terrible. And not only, sometimes Conlon will make that break up the middle. He'll go right and uh, he's not given. They'll turn around, recycle it and someone else will run it. So they need to definitely find, Shane Walsh obviously gave them a much better focal point when he came on. He'll start next year. They're, you know, they, they've a few tweaks to make. Oh, absolutely. There's a, there's a huge, they've made good strides this year. But if you, the, the big achievement for me was getting promotion back up to Division 1. Um, where they took a few, you know, they beat Kildare and Navin in a, in a fantastic game of football and things like that. But their championship performances, you would have to say, they've just reached what I would consider, they're just playing at par. They're beating all the teams that they should be beating because they're better than them. They're beating Leash, Clare, Carlo, you know, these type of things, Clare. Um, sorry, I said them twice. What's but, the uh, problem with Clare? Um, <laughs> but, you know, when they've come up against the, the top teams, Dublin beat them by 16 points, Donegal by nine, Mayo by nine. Yeah. And that's that's where me that's where currently they're at, at. Yeah, and, that's and they're there's at. nothing wrong with that. They've no. you know that that's that's just the level they're at, and there's a massive volume of work to take them to the next level, and it's predominantly based around what they do in possession. Out of possession, they have some fun, like their full but Mead's full backline is is really superb in one to one um, battles. They are doing it was really excellent well. again. Yeah, you know most of the time we have a great attacking platform from our half backline, but they're having to do. An awful lot of, like Donald Keoghan has to do an awful lot of heavy lifting, a bit like Michael Murphy does for Donegal. But Keoghan has to be our Mead's best attacker, you know, and still do all the defensive work as well because there's just a lack of vision and creativity from from the front eight. I think so. And that, that's really where they're at at the minute. Need some quality forwards. You just yeah. need some quality forwards. Well, quality it, it, it's forwards. the vision. It's, it, it's as you say, that to look up and deliver that pass. Now, sometimes they just don't have the bodies there because lads are, you know, they're working very hard and all that, but, but it's, another, it's, it another, doesn't Another problem is them. Conlon needs perfect balls, so you can't Correct, give him yeah. any ball, and Newman just stands there. Yeah. Like he's not trying to move at all. So in their defence, there's not much of a target up there. So, you know... Well, like the, ga the gap is too big. Like, me, they're getting a gap, the ball yeah. in the half-back line. It, they, they can't hit the full forward line. Oh, oh, Sullivan tries to hold that, like which is what McLaughlin tried to do for Mayo. Yeah. Both teams are set up almost yeah. identically. Trying but, to do know, the same thing. Trying to do the yeah. same thing. Um, Mayo scored a couple of good points when that link man worked and they were able to get it inside. Like, I mean, just on Shane Walsh kicking the freeze. Is he a free taker? I'm not sure he's a free taker. Like, I mean, he missed two easy ones. I know he's only a young fella and I thought he played very well in the game. But the reason I don't think he's a free taker, the two easy ones, which good free takers wouldn't miss, but... He had one which was a well kickable free and Conlon came short looking for it. Now there's no corner forward goes short. If MJ Tierney's taking a free for leash, I ain't making a run. That's yeah, not yeah. coming to me. Like would Conor Callaghan run for a short one for from Dean, Dean Rock? Rock? Not in a million years. This is going over the bar. But it made me wonder is Walsh a confident free taker or was Conlon trying to bail him out there? Well, it's hard to know. I think he does. I'm fairly sure he takes the freeze with his club all right, but I mean the the reality is is Shane Walsh sat his leave insert. Um, this year and yeah. was only drafted into the senior squad after that so I mean he's very very late coming into the squad and 
he's been thrust into the role of taking the freeze there, I suppose, after Mickey Newman went off injured in, in both the games where Walsh was on the field. So I suppose it was a little bit of a step into the unknown, uh, as, as you would expect. Um, and unfortunately for him, he was just... Uh, he underhit one and overhit another one. Yeah. Um, well, he was fouled for the one he underhit, yeah, which maybe. He and he was after doing. That. Yeah, he was after doing an awful lot of hard running. He had actually won won a ball out on the opposite wing, and the play had been recycled, and he then got it again. And Barry Dardis was on the field at the time for me, and he's he's a very reliable free taker. I thought he should have taken the one that Walsh took uh, after where, being fouled. Yeah, after being fouled, and then the one that was. Uh, kind of a, a we'll say it was a little bit further out possibly out of Walsh's range and Dardis is excellent from distance so they were maybe just two decisions at the time on the field look hindsight is wonderful like I mean the, we had an incident years ago where we played a championship game where Wexford came back from a long way down to beat us and I was on the freeze that day and we had a free which was tight enough angle on the right hand side Um but, you know, a kickable one, one that you'd expect to get. I was after cramping up. I felt I could, you know, that it, there was every chance I was going to cramp up kicking the free. So I, I told Brian Farrell to take kick it, who's an excellent free taker as well. On the day, I think it clipped the outside of the post and went wide. You know, and you, you then have the question marks after a game. Why didn't you kick it or should you have kicked it? But you make these decisions. Sometimes they work out. But you have to make the decision based on the information at the time. And Walsh shouldn't have kicked either of those frees. Yeah. Barry Darda should have kicked both yeah, of them. Yeah, but that's not... Walsh is too young to He's make too that call. He's too young to He's make that call. He's too young to make the call. He, he, he can take absolutely no blame in that regard. No, no, absolutely not. And I thought it was interesting that to put Stephen Cohen on Killian O'Sullivan. After yeah. the cleaning he got Stephen O'Brien, it's almost like James Horan going, well... Listen, this is my call, mm-hmm. and uh, like I would have thought, he was the last one to pick up yeah. Meads, probably livelier at wing or half forward, and he he did the exact same thing. Almost like one of those warnings: you're getting twenty minutes out here today, see how you go, or you're coming off. But he actually did all right. Yeah, he did all right on him. He did. Although uh, Killian was a bit, little bit wasteful. Um, so, like, I mean, the, the funny thing with Mayo is, while they're unimpressive for so long, they now have an All Ireland quarter final, a knockout All Ireland quarter final at home against Donegal. They couldn't have asked for it to be set up any better than that. You know what I mean? And we know what Mayo are like. They've 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 slept walk through teams or through games against inferior teams. They're able to rise it against the top level teams. Like I wouldn't expect to be for there to be anything in this. James Horn says two weeks off, which will have Durkin and Ruanam here and it will be back. Um two weeks off is completely different to what we've had the last five or six weeks. We've had we've had one training session a week. Um, just really maintenance to be able to have a break reflect and work on a few things for a home game in Castle Bar is ideal and a home all in quarter final yeah, fantastic no. where Mayo are in like, cause it's, it's brilliant and if you factor in then the number of in- knocks and injuries potentially that Donegal have at the minute um, it's amazing how the the, the thing is sort of swinging change. out towards well, Jason Mayo. McGee did his hammer it looks like I, I think Paddy McBrearty possibly did his hamstring as well towards the end yeah right Okay, so like I mean, that could be a huge thing if 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 the two of them are out. So Mayo are in a, Mayo were poor yesterday, but are in a, a strong position. I've, there's not much to say about Dublin. Um, you know, like I mean, what hasn't been said about them? They are an incredible team. You're almost sick saying it. They have no weak points that I can see. Like you could say, right, their full back line's a bit weak. It's no weaker than anybody else's. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and it's a, it's only weak because. They leave it exposed and good forwards. You know, it's not weak. No, it's, it's just it's a potential. It's, they're it's probably a, all all stars. Yeah, it's a potential. Yeah. It's a potential. You could get some joy because they're not a very very defensive team. They're a huge bigs team. They're strong. They're fit. They're tough. They're hard as nails. They're hard working. They have a fetching midfielder who's brilliant on the ground. They have scoring forwards. They have scoring forwards that can win their own ball. They have load of pace all over the field. They have tight marking defenders, attacking half backs. They have a running game. They have a kicking game. They're the best goalkeeper in the country. Like you could go on forever. They have no weak points. Everything you want in a team, they have it. Like I, I because of the way Donegal played yesterday, I'm putting Donegal into the Kerry category. I'm giving them a puncher's chance of potentially, mm. if they played Dublin 10 times, they might lose eight or nine. But the one could be this year when Dublin are under pressure. Like they, I, they might give I, Dublin I think s- if they played them a million times, they might win once. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm definitely elevating Donegal based on the way they played yesterday into being able to hurt, you know what I mean? Being able to hurt Dublin. Dublin wouldn't like to see what they saw from Donegal yesterday. You know what I mean? I would say that. that yeah, that's interesting. Cause I actually, I think I had Donegal there, but sort of brought them down a little bit, just off the back of Jamie Brennan. Now, it's one performance, but he was the guy that we were looking at. He was tearing everybody apart in Ulster. And I thought, 
if he's not liking Tom O'Sullivan this tight team, how is he going to get on with John Small hanging off him or you know one of these Dublin backs? I just sat. Like, yeah. These if these boys can be nullified that much against Kerry. It's going to be even worse against Dublin. Yeah, I, these things happen though. Like I mean, he probably had himself under a lot of pressure. He was yeah. a nailed on all star coming into Croke Park, and I, I think he just had an off game himself. You know, I I whatever. But, uh, like, I mean, I still see him as a hugely uh, important player for Donegal. But Dublin versus the spread, we joke about this all the time on the show, right? So, eight of nine, this is in the last two years, eight of the nine spreads that have gone into double digits, they've covered all of them. They've covered eight of the nine. And the only one they didn't cover was Ross Common last year in a dead rubber when they beat them by 14 and the, and the spread was 14. They are destroying teams destroying them this is the Connacht champions they destroyed over at half time waste of time might as well have been Mead or Leash or uh, Kildare in Leinster which it, it puts a casts a shadow over the whole Leinster championship because Mead are able to put it up to Donegal and Mayo now they lose by 8 or 9 but Mead are not a bad team but people think they're worse than they are because of what Dublin do to them routinely Kildare the same Super 8's last year could have beaten Monaghan could have beaten Galway at home Kildare I think could be a big player with all their teams Again, the Dublin shadow is cast on them. Look what Dublin do to every single team. They've mauled Tyrone. They've mauled Mon- Monaghan. They mauled Roscommon. They maul every Galway in an all Ireland semi final. They all get it. Every team's getting it. <laughs> so, like, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's absolutely incredible. Like uh, Anthony Cunningham said after the game, but you know, it was a harsh lesson there in the first half. Huge, huge variety in Dublin's game. Huge pace, huge physicality. And that's, that's a fact. That's just the way, the way it is. Um, I think Jim Gavin said uh, it was a tough test after the game. Just this, he's just a wind-up merchant at this stage. Um, there's not much more we can say about Dublin. I thought I'd, I'll just finish up on Conor Daly because we have to get into this one. I'd be surprised if Conor Daly features for Roscommon next year under Anthony Cunningham. I'd say he's absolutely livid. Like this was, this was jumping off a sinking ship saying we're being hammered. I don't want that. I don't want to be on the field here. We're being hammered. I'm going to leave the other 14 worry about this and I'm getting off because this was just I want to get sent off. This was a blatant high tackle that was a yellow and then one of the most blatant black card foot trips you'll ever see. Running through and goals. You wouldn't see it in a junior match. Kicking a lad's yeah. leg like that going past him. Now, one thing about Conor Daly, like I would be asking serious questions of his, his ability to be a teammate to the rest of his teammates. And if I was having a players meeting, I would be calling him out on that. You left us stranded in Croke Park, won 15 to 7 points down. Why did you do that? I'd be asking him. I would be calling him out in front of all my teammates. Why would you leave us hang out to drive where you take the easy option of sitting on the bench? Why would you do that? Like, it was unacceptable at this level of football. And, like, I mean, it's very un- unusual to see it. Yeah, it is. And I would totally agree with you. Um, yeah, there's nothing much more to add to what no. you said, to be honest. Uh, very, very disappointing for all of his teammates in that. Um, it's the last thing you want is somebody doing something like that. I mean, everybody on the pitch is feeling the the embarrassment or the pain of what's yeah. going on and then for somebody to just make it worse for all the rest of you by making it better yeah, for himself <laughs> yeah yeah what, basically what, what was he expecting did he think it was going to be easy enough well, against he, Dublin was yeah. he surprised that they were that good like you know I don't know but I know he wanted off the field <laughs> like I mean we've all gone through it being hammered like that, I'd love. I want. To, I remember Tyrone destroyed us in an All Ireland quarter final. Whatever about up. something like that happening in the injury time at the end of a game, yeah, or yeah, a minute yeah. to play. But I mean, it's thirty three minutes in the gone. First half, yeah, thirty three minutes. I mean, gone. You, have, you have plenty of time to realise that you've lost the game. Like the game is over after twenty minutes, you know you've lost the game. So then you just you refocus to a to a different goal, which is maybe win the second half or get something out of the game because yeah. you can't dis- you can't disappear you can't leave at half time I mean everybody would want to say here listen ref just leave it at that we'll, we'll head on but yeah. you can't do that yeah. so you have to change your focus and try and get something out of it um, and and that's what would have happened I'm sure at half time that you look the game is gone but we can still get something out of this here it's a game in Croke Park for us whatever it's all hollow but it's just about distracting your mind from the fact that this is a huge embarrassment and humiliation because that's what it is. Yeah, no, it is. It was it was definitely a weird one, and there were two of the most blatant fouls. It was almost like saying, "Referee, get me out, get me out of yeah. here." What I was the Tyrone story you were going to tell? Oh no, like I mean, just being hammered and want just wanting to get off the field, yeah. like wanting to be out of there. It's embarrassing to be on the field with this happening, and you want to be subbed off even. 
But I, I've no doubt he wanted to get sent off. You don't trip, you don't kick a f- He kicked him. <laughs> so <laughs> you, deliberate. You wouldn't yeah. see it in the Masters football I'm playing where referees yeah. don't really care too much. Like it's <laughs> mad, Max. Anyways, listen, we'll leave it there because we've gone way over time on the top of the show. There's just too much to get in. We'll talk about Donegal Kerry next. Okay, so both managers were, were saying pretty much the same thing after this game, lads. So they were both really happy with the character. Declan Bonner said, from our point of view, I thought it was a great game of football. The lads showed re- real character. Both teams went for it and it was an epic battle. Peter Keane said, there was a never say, die, never say die attitude by us. And I thought there was a couple of frees that went against us. We talked about this already. Um, they were get, or Every time we, we, they got ahead, they were getting back some way or another. But I thought we fought um, and fought well. So, like, I mean, I think they both did. Both teams were gone. I thought when Donegal got the penalty, Kerry, for there was parts of the second half where they looked out of it. They looked in big trouble. Um, Donegal had the upper hand on them. In the first half, Donegal looked in real trouble. Kerry could have destroyed them. Clifford missed 1-1 one, one that I would have scored. Sean O'Shea kicked a terrible wide off his left foot. There's 1-2 that they've left behind him. Gini blasted over the bar instead of a goal. I thought Donegal were struggling to stay with Kerry but did stay with them and in the second half I thought Donegal shaded the second half then Yeah it was look it was just one of those types of games that ebbed and flowed it was it was end to end each team had periods of dominance in the match um, there were times where both teams looked dead I, I think really in the end I would say it was a it was a it was a superb result for Donegal just given all the players that they were missing through injury and that they lost through the course of the game. Like if Michael Murphy had had been able to play at centre forward for the whole yeah. match, there's no doubt Donegal would have won the game and probably would have won it with a few points to spare. He was kind of robbed from their attack yeah. a little bit more. It just meant he had to expend too much energy around the middle and doing defensive work and it blunted his influence in the attack just on late one, in the game. Yeah, just so that we know, people know what happened. When Jason McGee went off after 24 minutes, Murphy went to midfield, Darrow Boyle came on and Stephen O'Brien who was roasting O'McHugh and O'McHugh went wing forward. So I would I would take your point on Murphy maybe being lost to that, but Darrow Boyle was a huge upgrade on O'McHugh oh, and absolutely. Stephen O'Brien. Yeah, it's, it's surprising that O'Brien did brilliantly start. Well on yeah, him. He, d- he did a good job on him because he had the pace and physicality for him. O'Brien was just way too strong for O'Brien. McHugh. Oh, it was a mismatch. How would they have thought that was an acceptable matchup? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't no know. Idea. Unless you're just looking at shapes and thought, yeah, he, he'd be the one to follow him around the pitch. But yeah, as Keane says, like, Will has the energy and he has the speed. He was the right man for it. Yeah. But in, in the second half, like it was crazy. When Gallen went on, Gallen, uh, Jamie Brennan and Paddy McBrearty were always up front. There was none of this because... Uh, dropping players back or anything like that and then in the half forward line you had Langan who wasn't dropping back and all. I looked at the Donegal forwards at one stage um, when Kerry were attacking and there was four or five of them up there <laughs> like I mean yeah. Donegal have proved and I, this is definitely the Rochford influence because how did Kerry or how did Mayo beat Kerry they beat them by going for them and they beat them well by giving good ball inside to Moran and O'Connor and these lads and Kevin McLaughlin and Jason Doherty so this was definitely Rochford's influence there's no doubt about that yeah, let, let's get at them. Let's be like, Kerry. Yeah. This is where they're weak when you actually go at them. Yeah, no, I must say, though, I'm very impressed with Kerry's defending. Like, you've just seen them. Yeah. Right? They're very tight, and it is like, you know, they, they have been sort of chastised over the last couple of weeks, and every single player is, is on it now. Like, they all have a grip. And what made the game so good yesterday as well was so much of the sort of off the ball stuff that was happening because there were so many, like, little scuffles falling out over the place but it was because the Kerry men were so aggressive off the ball they were yeah. Ty Morley had a brilliant battle with yeah, that was a good. proper matchup and we predicted, predicted that matchup because they're just a brilliant physical matchup for each other they're almost identically built yeah. um, they're both fast but not total speed demons like I mean Thomas Sullivan did brilliant on Jamie Brennan I didn't think that was possible mm. and got up to get a score so I do agree with you I think Kerry's defence are starting to answer questions now did they concede 120 <laughs> but you're going to concede that by being left yeah. wide open these level I keep saying it these are the highest level forwards they're going to do that but Donegal amazingly said to Kerry yesterday we'll see your forwards because we've six good ones of our own and they do oh they they absolutely do Uh, it was just uh, I suppose from when you see it there was so often in the game where there'd be a one-on-one battle but when you when you took your eye off the when you just scanned the field there was just one-on-one all over the place yeah there was and it was hand on the man now look there's times we spoke about that where that's 
utterly pointless and I would say that Kerry on a few occasions left it a little bit late to leave their own man to try and shore up the gaps but I can understand how it happens because I think with the pace at which the game was played at I think lads were just so out on their feet at stages of the game that it was almost a relief to just grab their own man mm. and just say I have my man I'm doing my job yeah and it was only then when it when it sort of opened up they'd say oh god now I have to run after another fella here and they'd leave but yeah. it was just kind of too late but I put that down to fatigue as much as anything else but, and, but that's the thing and like I mean it was man for man everywhere in the field now that's whether there was five fours left up or whether you'd drop players back everyone was pushing up on them so you could have man for man inside one half with everyone barred a two on two down the other end so it's still man for man but you don't have to always worry about your own man. If your man breaks your tackle, someone's close by you and they'll move over and then the player on the ball has a quick decision to make and he might throw it over your head and then you have another man close enough to punch that, you know what I mean, that pass away. You can go man for man and still be very defensively hard to beat, you know what I mean? So the excitement of it being man for man, but also teams knowing that, right, it's not easy to be a decision maker when every man has a man. So if that pressure is enough, they're going to make mistakes. And there was loads of turnovers yeah. from mistakes, just from a lot of pressure being put on the man, a pass being given to someone and someone abandoning their man and just getting a fist in mm-hmm. at it. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was great to watch that way. And like, it's not easy to hide, Ellery, you know, when it's man for man. And I don't even mean that in a marking sense. Like, because there was all these sort of like detailed battles all over the pitch. Like Lyon came on instead of Gavin White, he marked Ryan McHugh, but then he was winning kickouts as well. It was all these oh, he players. He caught one were brilliant kickout. Unbelievable. I think he won two in, in the game, but they were all trying to contribute something in a, an attacking sense as well. Like it was uh, such a good game. Like, you know, I, I, I did, like it was, you said hurling, I didn't like the hurling comparison, but, <laughs> but it was like all these battles just unfolding all over the pitch. Yeah, it was weird because I understand um, Donegal had some injuries, but uh, you could argue that Kerry's injury was almost more oh, um, David, Moran, Kirk, David yeah. Moran. Like, I mean, they started with Adrian Spillane and Dermot O'Connor in midfield. Now, Adrian Spillane is uh, a supporting actor. He's not the main man, and he, and he turned out having to be the main man. Um, you had Adrian Spillane and Dermot O'Connor Dermot O'Connor is Clifford's age he's, he'd be still under 21 again this year like he's one of the younger of I think he was on that last minor team the Hammer Derry like you have the two of them going up against um, McFadden, Murphy and McGee that was a mismatch straight away that was advantage Donegal big time when Moran you know what I mean when Moran was out and in actual fact O'Connor was taken off Adrian Spillane got injured now late in the game so I think Kerry had two or three kickouts towards the end where they had no midfielder of any description Jack Sherwood was the only target and Donegal had a press and I was thinking geez, where have Kerry's options for midfield gone? Yeah well I think Jack Barry Jack Barry's He's injured got, as is well Is he injured? Yeah, is he? injured and there was well. an O'Sullivan as well that, that played a couple of years ago for Fitzmaurice uh, that yeah, big fella Sherwood was the, uh, Jack Sherwood coming on actually he made He, he was, played well He played well He added a bit of pace and dynamism to the midfield and fresh legs at a time when it was required He made a couple of good driving runs forward Griffin does too Griffin makes a good impact yeah, off the bench He's a very powerful runner yeah. um, And t- to be fair look despite that mismatch Kerry you know, Kerry they, they battled fierce hard there. I suppose the 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 weather conditions kind of um in the second half maybe helped for that. It was very difficult for anybody to gain clean possession. Um but yeah, you would definitely say that uh, the the loss of Morn of course was huge to begin with. So I, I don't know, it's hard to know who was weakened more by, by the value of injuries like Owen Bon Gallagher missing you I mean Donegal were missing three of their starting defenders. He was massive, yeah. You know, they're they're all I think what has to be said is that all players that kinda came into the fray really added to it as well. There was nobody that really looked out of their depth, which shows the quality of both squads really. Yeah, no massive uh, quality in both squads. For the kick out, Donegal retained twenty two of their twenty five. Now Kerry gave McFadden up to them. Like when McFadden dropped back as a sweeper and then they had a quick kick out. They mount, McFadden collected loads of quick kick outs. And then McBrearty, when he came on for McFadden, got them as well. So Spillane wasn't, either he wasn't on tune for pushing down onto it, or Kerry were almost happy to let Patton tap it short and not get caught out with his really aggressive ones. We didn't see much aggression yeah, from he, Patton. Yeah, because he, he hit a few just ridiculous long range ones in the second half, Patton, when the game was getting a bit stretched. There was one in particular, I think it might have ended up being called back. He hit it 70 metres over the top to Ryan McHugh. 
and now Ryan McHugh was only just gen- making his way back down the field after making another <laughs> ridiculous run. So you know he was he was at his usual. He was almost crawling back down the <laughs> pitch. But as soon as the ball was in his hand, he was going to make another lung yeah. bursting run. So uh, no, Patton had a few of them. I mean, he's an exceptionally good kicker of the ball. And in fairness, there was probably only one carry kick out that um, could have potentially led to downfall, and that was the one that Ryan McHugh kind of caught that was trying to be played short uh, near the end of the game. Yeah. So you know, both both keepers were were fairly were fairly good, and uh, look, more to do with the movement out the field as well. I mean, the the movement from all the players out the field. Kerry do a fairly obvious tactic where they all bunch together in the yeah, middle, and they were doing there was all sorts of antics there do as the game got uh, fairly frantic. Do you remember there was a free? Someone was on a free for Kerry, and there was an injury, so it gave Donegal a chance to man up. Who was taking the free? Could have been Thomas Sullivan or someone, and to the point where. Jamie Brennan had gone across to mark the goalkeeper, so there was nothing. Yeah. There was nothing on. And it was actually McBrearty switched off and le- left Tyg Morley go short for the free. And I was like, Jesus, McBrearty, like that was too yeah, easy. I, so I, do you know, I, I think I have a bit of sympathy for him. I'm fairly sure he would have pulled hamstring at that stage because he, <laughs> he, he, had, he, had, he had definitely asked to be taken off. You know, he told the bench he needed to come off, and that was probably with 10 minutes to go. So he, he stayed on for the remainder of the game um, despite the fact that he, he was carrying a leg. He was only able to really jog around. See, that's the problem, Willie. When, when you get a yellow card and you're not a good player, you come off. But when you get injured and you're a good player, you're <laughs> not allowed to come off. <laughs> Killian Spillane surprised me. Like a proper poaching inside forward, not getting on too much ball. Got three points. McFadden Farry, we know, is an excellent player. Yeah. Um, I thought McFadden Farry is more of a fella that would follow a, a half forward around the place. McFadden Farry is potential weakness with him in a full back line in the air, right? But Spillane got three off him, but you'd say they broke 50 50. Is that fair to say? Yeah, like at the start, I was thinking, geez, are, are they wasting McFadden Farry? Could, could they be using him on Clifford or, or somebody else? Like, you know, but um, I thought, I actually thought Spillane got the better of him because his turn of pace, so even when he wasn't scoring, he caused like uh, the Donegal back so much problems because he took the ball in the loop. And then just opened everything up. Yeah. Like he always turned and ran with it. And Spillane actually got two in the second half, which got Kerry back into the game. Do you know what I mean? Kerry were in trouble when he got two kind of against the run of play. Got two from the from the end line, mm. similar type scores. Yeah. Ah, oh, look, it was it's just an absolute classic, really, in so many ways. Yeah. Like, I mean, there was just so many incidents that you could that you can point back to of, you know, superb one on one defending, superb you know, athleticism, a superb bit of score taking. I mean, look, it was just, it had everything that you would want from a game of football. Yeah, it definitely. Did you notice Clifford pawning off McManaman when he went forward? Which is, this is outstanding from Kerry. And it, like, thank God a team has done what we've been saying on this show for long enough. So McManaman takes off. Clifford looks around and says, oh, well, there's a spare Donegal man here. I'm going to move across to him. We're pairing off one by one. So there has to be a carry man out the field that is going to be able to pick up my man. And that's exactly what happened. So a couple of times he pawned off to Sean O'Shea. Sean O'Shea, as we know, has a great appetite for work and as a team player, he'd pick him up quickly. He'd point, pick up my man. So then by the time there was two ter- changeovers of players, now everyone's man on man. Yeah. And Clifford has a man down here. Clifford followed him twice. He fo- the two times he followed McManaman when there was no spare Donegal player and he had to go. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So they, like, I mean, they definitely have that organised to carry forward. Well, because that Clifford can, doesn't have to the, work that hard. Yeah, and even th- what they're trying to all do is drop a line. And you can yeah. see them doing that, that if there's three Donegal defenders there, the full forward line nearly take them and make sure that the man who's running, pa- if, even if it's their man, they're kind of pointing, Stephen O'Brien, take the corner back and I'll take the wing yeah. back here. And that's the way they have it organised. Now, they do drift out the field a good bit. Like they're, They could be back in the middle of the pitch by the time they have this organised. And then once they have it done Clifford and it's organised, they get back, they try to reset yeah. and get back up the field again. They, they had that um, in the other side as well. You were saying about Spillane not following McFadden. But what was happening was if Niall O'Donnell was dropping... Spillan picked him up and then it meant that Paul Murphy could sit at centre back. Right. You know, when they always had, they didn't have a sweeper, but they had that number six blocked. Yeah. There's a lot of pawning off like that. And I think you can do that pawning off, which has been going on for years as well. When you're going man for man and you see a spare man on the other end, well, then you know you have a spare man. So let's all filter this around and let's all match up on someone that's closest to you. And you can easily do that, you know. So that's another huge aspect of games that are played like this you know what I mean and it's watching them organise it it's just interesting seeing it on the field they're just really good at it Kerry and you obviously have the the knock on effect of um, Clifford not getting too tired so just to finish up here lads is so we're saying neither of these have a chance of beating Dublin (laughs) 
I don't, don't burst so. my bubble. Uh, do you give them a, you give them a puncher's chance. Like No, I don't I actually don't give any either of them. Of them. No, I think Dublin are just so much better than the rest. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately. No, uh, look, I'm tending to agree with you. It's almost holding out for it not to be a procession of a championship. You know, I'm it's almost the hope that's going to kill me thinking that one of the two of these teams by going for Dublin could score two early goals now Dublin are chasing their tail. You know, that's Look, it's a it's a long sh- it's a long there's show. A, there's it? always a chance, um, but the worry is that the look the, there are a few, a few things I would say is that Dublin's substitutes have contributed absolutely zero to them at all. Any time when Dublin are making changes now, it's it's weakening their team. Well, I, w- the I think common s- game wasn't a good because they I took off all their good lads. Like you I, mean, that I know, was just I know that, lads. but they they do they do weaken the team with the exception of maybe one or two specialists. Like for example, Merchant is a specialist that could come on and mark a particular type of player, maybe like a Sludden from Tyrone, and that's a specific matchup. But against most teams, he would be he would be a weaker player than you know the starting player. So they're it's really up front where Dublin subs are not really making any inroads at all. They're, they're significantly inferior to the starting six forwards. Yeah. But and I that's mean, not that's, a slight. That's on not them. really yeah. a slight on them. Most forwards are inferior to these lads because like Con O'Callaghan. We'll talk. Uh, you have to leave, Keen. We'll talk about. Con I was O'Callaghan. just trying to find a positive as to how maybe Kerry or Donegal could catch them, but or, or Tyrone even, but it it or Mayo even, but it's just it's it seems unlikely with with the performances that they're putting in. They just seem to have. Um, they seem to have way more than everybody else across the field. Yeah, and uh, even the Kerry bench. I know we did mention Jack Sherwood uh, coming on, but he came on in midfield. He's a defender. Now he played well. Mark Griffin came on in the half back line. He used to be a full back. Then they had Michal Burns. Is he going to win a game against Dublin? Jonathan Lyon, Tomas O'Shea, Gavin O'Sullivan. It's not the most feared full forward lines either. Mm. Dara Moynihan, you, uh, James O'Donoghue. You know, t- t- um, Tommy Walsh is a forgotten man. What's happened to him? He's tugged out. He's there in the 26. He hasn't been seen, was it since the league final? Fi- Put in the, a good performance the in the league in, in Killarney was the last time I nearly remember him in the league final. Yeah, like he's Are they holding him for a potential surprise against Dublin? You don't, well, I don't know. But I, if I saw James O'Donoghue and Tomas, uh, Tommy Walsh coming on there, maybe with Griffin Sherwood and somebody, you know, line isn't bad. Yeah. It's more of a, there's more meat to that subs bench. Did he, did he have the backs that carried on a goal like the, that the Mayo did in their peak? You know the backs that can hold Dublin and let you get at them. You know because Mayo obviously ran them close so many times, but that was because they had man on man matchups. And then if you had a better forward line than Mayo, then maybe you could beat them. But I don't think they have the backs as good. Yeah, no, probably not. But I think Kerry are improving and getting there. So like, I mean, I'm I'm st- I'm I'm clinging to my hope, lads, that Donegal Donegal, in my opinion, have impressed me no end. Having to play in one season like they did against Tyrone, and then play in the same season against like they did against Kerry we just don't see enough of that and it's proved that you can absolutely tailor your game plan based on who you're playing if your players are good enough and your management team's good enough absolute credit to Donegal I think they're a huge player for the next uh, for the next few years in Gaelic football with that forward line and the fact that they're going to use them you know use them now and trust to their fence so fantastic so right we'll come back with performance of the weekend Okay, so Paddy Power performance the weekend. It's just me and you um, for this one, Conan. And the first one has to be Ryan McHugh. Absolutely incredible performance from Ryan McHugh. He's all over the field. We know that. He's changed something in his running ability. And it's almost like swerving over and back. It's, it's like a slalom. It's a slalom run. It's like a downhill skier yeah. where you're going boom, boom, boom. And whoever's marking him is kind of backtracking and they sell to one and Ryan's gone the other way. By the time they look around, they're not sure which side he's actually on. So backing off Ryan McHugh is definitely not the right way to go. Um, You know, he looks completely disinterested in the play and all of a sudden then just pushes his man gone. When he gets the ball in his hand, it's close to impossible at this stage to stop him. Yeah. He's so sharp, you have to back off him though because they just leave you on your arse, I think. Yeah. You know, so you, you always end up backtracking and then he's just... Yeah, he he's just one step ahead of you. Before you turn, he's gone the other way. And what I like about him most is like I think he's a firefighter as well. So he's helping out in defence. But anytime somebody's under any bit of pressure, it's Ryan McHugh who's made himself available. And it's always a good run that somebody can pick him out then. And then suddenly from you know twice I think in the corner under the Kuzik stand, there's somebody under pressure. And then the run that he made, it was a twenty yard kick pass out over his head. And then McHugh's got them on the attack from a period yeah. of pressure that they were on. Yeah, and the great thing, the knock-on effect of him 
been so good at these slaloming runs is Michael Murphy sees this and sees this developing and he's gone he bursts into he life he bursts into life because yeah. he knows that there, at, at one point in this run McHugh's going to cut in field and when he cuts in field that's where I want to be meeting him there for yeah. that you know what I mean that pop pass or not even not only the pop pass he did that uh, yesterday but also just be outside him he'll yeah. drag to, he'll drag two towards him and then there's a, you know what I mean there's obviously a spare man Stephen O'Brien is another example of someone who does that slalom run it's this downhill skiers it's just cut yeah. angle cut angle cut you know what I mean it's terrifying just, it's terrifying yeah. when you're backing off it's terrifying because you, you're looking one way and he's gone the other way it's just <laughs> like it's almost like playing a game with a child where you're coming both sides <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> holding the ball the other side of him <laughs> So Ryan McHugh, yeah, that was one of the best games I've ever seen Ryan McHugh play in, just at his very, very top level. And do you know what? Genuinely think Ryan McHugh and Michael Murphy, this is a breath of fresh air for them. Like This is them showing off their very, very best in a game where they're not being crowded out and they're not pawning a pass off to someone else. They're effect- Whenever they get the ball, they're affecting the game in a positive way. There's no screen. There's no, I'll move it across here and I've won a ball. They're now impacting the game positively. And like it's an example of uh, Michael Murphy when he gets in a game that's not dominated by defences. Look what look at that monster of a man yeah. that that is. Like to think Colin O'Rourke did say that earlier. I don't want to give it a talk about it too much, and I'm disappointed with O'Rourke because he's usually much more sensible than that to be having a crappy old debate about how good Michael Murphy is. What are you talking about? Like, I mean, the man's a phenomenon. <laughs> like, he's, <laughs> he's just unreal. Yeah. He's the number one transfer on any team in the country, as far as I'd be concerned. Um, so just unbelievable. I think they're, I'd say they went into that, that dressing room after that match and went, Jesus, that was some game to play in. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Whereas it and wasn't... All, yeah, all the knackered as well, probably. Knackered. And, and we pulled season. it out of the fire and this is what we can do now at the top level because yeah. I think every team knows that that is the only thing that maybe will beat Dublin. So for Donegal to maybe have proven to themselves who we went toe-to-toe with Kerry who have a phenomenal forward line, that will have given a massive confidence. Do yeah. you know what I mean? To be involved in a game like that and to... To be honest, to be looking the stronger in the second half for a lot of it too. Yeah, and I think Michael Murphy said a couple of years ago, or maybe last year, about playing Dublin. Like, we know now that you have to score 22, yeah. 23 points. You probably have to score more. But the fact that they're thinking that way too, and they can do it against Kerry in such a toe-to-toe game, and a wet game when there were chances left from both teams as well. Yeah. Like, they will be thinking, like, I mean, we can get at Dublin if somebody gives us a chance. Yeah, to. no, they definitely will. Paul Geaney scored 1-4. So he started wing forward. I thought it was very interesting. Spillane and Clifford obviously were inside on their own. Geaney didn't spend any time really inside with them. He was more in the half forward line. He went in around, like Sean O'Shea was dropping deep. So Geaney was in around holding the half forward line a little bit more. But like, I mean, he definitely wasn't playing on the inside line. So he played, he scored 1-4. Could have had a second goal to one. Obviously he blasted over the bar. But stood up and was counted when Kerry needed him. Kerry got some great scores in that second half. Yeah. Toward the second half of the second half. Yeah, the role suited him. Like you, yeah. you were saying about like this top level and these players really need a space. So he was just waiting for somebody to find him in an inch of space. And when yeah. he got it, bang, over the bar. Yeah, And it was killer for Donegal. He were doing well in a lot of cases. And I didn't think he had the ability to play in the f- half forward line. You know, just when you maybe have a fella tailored that he's an f- inside forward, he's good in the air. He's not doesn't base his game around speed. I was thinking maybe the half hour line is, isn't for him, but he's well able for that. He's yeah. well able for that role. Yeah, well he can win all sorts of balls, well can't they? So yeah, I suppose he can play so it, do, it does make sense and huge appetite for work as well. Maddie Donnelly changed the game. Um, I think he's a little bit like Kevin McManaman now. Is and defenders need to cop on and stop marking him so tightly. Get away from him. Stand off him. Make him play it and get your hand in. Because when you're on him. Sure, he's you're like a fly. He's just so physically yeah. strong that he he the, he set up the Tyrone goal out of nothing. There should be nothing on there when he gets that ball out by the sideline. He cuts in, takes two men with him, and I think it was McKiernan just timed his run beautifully. Bang, goal! Like there was no goal on there when that ball went in. Yeah. Did you? <laughs> I don't want to bring it back to Donegal, but Michael Murphy's done the exact same thing. He did it three times yesterday where he turns around and then somebody gets too tight to him. He solos and just spins the shoulder on them. But he's too big, strong and fast yeah. and he just gets past him. But Donnelly's the exact same. But watching that, Donnelly has to play inside because you're right, you probably have to stand off him to mark him. But when you do get tight on him, he's unmarkable. And if you have him and McShane doing that, yeah. I mean, like, licking your lips. It's a huge threat. Yeah. It's a huge, huge threat because they're both so physically um, imposing. 
and Tyrone seem nervous about giving away that defensive game plan but just suppose you can still play defensively and leave two up like you're just losing one extra man now in fairness Donnelly is so good around the middle third that they like him out there too but on the evidence of the Cork game Tyrone have to look at the teams left in this right yeah. and they have to look at Dublin what defensive system won't beat them they have to look at Donegal Kerry Mayo not going to beat any of them yeah. so either Tyrone wake up now and say we have to change back to pre-Donegal you know to that game plan because this is why we brought it in because we know it, it's not going to beat the big teams and there's only big teams left now there's Dublin in the last Super 8 they might play silly beggars there you've got Mayo, Donegal or Kerry and then you'll have Dublin again yeah. So like wh- what, are, what are you wasting your time With a defensive game plan Any more for We said there was a time And place for it Maybe to get through The qualifiers But now they absolutely Have to change yeah. They have to change With them two in there And they have to have Peter Hart and Niles Sludden Holding the half forward line A bit more Yeah And like oh, And we know the work That Matty Donnelly does Around the middle And he's great there But it's like having the best right hook in boxing, but only using it to block your face with. Like, use it. Like, try and hit somebody. Donnelly and McShane could beat Dublin. Like, they did beat them in the league. I think, like, on their day, and again, it's probably a 1 in 10 chance. Less than 1 in a million, what Cian says. But if you give them the right ball... Like, Do- we've seen Donnelly throughout the last four years. He's probably the best at carrying possession and not worrying about who's around him. Even better than David Moore. Yeah. He holds it for longer than any other player. So yeah. when he's in the full forward line, he's always looking to take somebody on and get into the post. Yeah. And what that does, like the goal against Cork, it just yeah. opens it up. And, no, and I think I think Mickey Hart will realise that. Look who's left. I hope so. Look at the way they're playing and see what see what we're going to play against him. Conor Callahan, geez, he showed another um, element to his game, that high fielding. And it was interesting... Uh, Paul Early mentioned in the COCOM very good COCOM I criticise COCOMs a lot but this was e- excellent co-commentary he said he was watching the Dublin warm up and I've watched the Dublin warm up a lot and I've kind of stopped paying attention to it because they run through the same kind of routine all the time but he said they added in a kick into the full forward line and a high fetch into the warm up and they definitely haven't done that in any warm up I'd seen so I just thought that was a nice little bit of co-commentary to, to give you based on what Con did in the first half, you know, yeah, where he was fetching. Was. And that point he scored uh, when it was 3 all, where he fielded the ball. And Malouli, absolutely dangerous. That was that was a yellow card, only you'd never get one for it, but he tackled him in the air. Con O'Callaghan could have broken his leg coming down on that, could have done his cruciate, could have done his medial ligament, could have done all sorts of damage in any way. He landed awkwardly. I don't want to be critical of Ryan McHugh. If Ryan McHugh had taken that hit, he would have stayed on the ground. Con bounced straight back up and stuck it over the bar. Like, he, he was entitled to stay down. He was fouled in yeah. the air by Baluli there, and he had no interest in staying down. He had a chance to get up and yeah. score. It was an unbelievable ah, stuff. He's a machine. Like, and the core on him is the probably, like, as, as much as he's big and strong now, his core, he's burst through the first tackle yeah. all the time. So he's always looking for a goal chance. It's... it's it's scary like and what, what he it, does. And the shaved head, he just he doesn't <laughs> yeah. he doesn't look like a chap anymore. He looks like a hard as nails Dublin yeah. footballer. Like you know what I mean? He looks like just his legs look he just he's the strength. Army camp for the it last does. Year. It yeah. does. It looks like he you're not messing with him now that he's served his apprenticeship and was a supporting actor and now wants a, a piece yeah. of them, you know, being the main man. Yeah, burst onto the scene, he was class and then had a difficult second year and now he's, yeah, he's come back, shaved head, bigger, meaner. Better, <laughs> but like, I think he's been in a boot camp somewhere yeah. for a while. But he does, he definitely looks a different, uh, based on that game. Now, he looks like a different uh, prospect. The high ball is a great thing that Jim Gavin's brought in because we were always talking about marking Dublin from the front. You can't mark somebody from the front if they're going to lump a ball no. over your head, you don't want to be caught in front of them. No, so that's a good way of sort of keeping defenders honest. And I don't know how far they look down the line, but Kerry's full back line isn't that big. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. You don't know what's going on with the ah, well, with Jim Gavin. They, Ross Common, they you know, tip. Oh yeah, one <laughs> game at a time. Very tough test. Um, Thomas Sullivan definitely deserves a shout out. He did a brilliant job, and Jamie Brennan, um, a brilliant matchup for him. Uh, great pace, got forward to knock Jamie Brennan off his mm. off his game as well. Um, so he was very good. Michael Murphy. Not much more we can say about Michael Murphy. One seven three from play. You just never felt he was going to miss the penalty. You never for a second, even though I knew exactly where he was putting it. I was saying, I guarantee you this is going bottom left because for right footers, look at Dear McConnelly. Any pressure kick for a right footed kicker, I'd love to see stats on it. They all go bottom left. It is the high percentage mm. chance you can get power on it, you can get placement on it. You can't get the same power going the other side. It's riskier, it's harder. And I was just like, I remember even for Connolly's one with Clark in the All-Ireland Final saying, Clark, guess right. He's going right. Yeah. Take the chance. And I was saying the same thing 
um, yesterday for uh, Ryan go right take a chance he's going right and he did go right you just know yeah. it's a, it's it's their go to penalty was McBurty looking to hit that and there was a bit of a, a, a handing off all right yeah, I, yeah I love that once that happened I was like he's definitely scoring like just this call and rank you know ah, I'll take it Patrick I'm, I'm nailing these frees I'm having a good game yeah and he nailed a couple of great ones they, they were all Ireland final 2012-esque those yeah. long range frees that uh, Mur- uh, Michael Murphy got he's just a phenomenal player Colin Boyle got man of the match in the first game he deserved man of the match um he loves this role of being the sweeper. He was letting McMahon go off and he was trying to pawn him off to somebody else and he was holding the the centre-half back position. He's good at interceptions. He's a warrior. He took about 10 steps for his point, a little bit more. Rode a tackle. We've yeah. seen this so many times that I'm not even going to uh, talk about it too much. But like if Andy Moran was on the field for the whole game, he would definitely be... Like Andy Moran was, out, was the outstanding player of the second half. Uh, Lee Keegan was outstanding in the second half and I was looking at Lee Keegan in the first half saying Jesus Ke- Keegan's seriously off form but he yeah. came into it when they needed him um, I think Moran's uh, his first two possessions he set up Fergal Boland and Killian O'Connor for points from play then he scored a point of his own then he caught the kick out that set up McLaughlin's goal from a short kick out then he got fouled for an O'Connor free that's all in a half you're looking at 1-5 there Yeah. do you know what I mean he just he has to start like he just transforms like the movement up there and it's so static without him and predictable and he's just always available it just changes everything for him but yeah Colin Boyle it was um it was good to see actually there's one time he was chasing O'Sullivan out to the wing and he got out in that famous punch you know got the ball out for a, a sideline but it was the first time I had like I saw him in a while having to actually sprint toe for toe with somebody for fifty yards, and it was like ah, he hasn't lost that. Yeah, I thought you know because he's playing a sweeper and he's getting a bit more comfortable. Maybe he's lost a yard or two of pace, but he hasn't. Like he's still nippy across the ground. Yeah, no, he's nippy enough across the ground. I thought it was interesting that they brought Andy Mooring Mooring on at half time, because you would say if you were thinking about it, you'd bring him on with five minutes gone in the second half to get that big cheer from the Mayo crowd. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? You lose that when you bring on your talisman at half time. And I thought Horan might have been maybe a little bit smarter. Then again, if he waited five minutes, he wouldn't have got those first two, maybe first two assists. Yeah. To know. I mean, you're such a bad first half sometimes. I think you need to sub there at half time just to say, here's exactly what we're doing now. It's weird. Half. I thought Darren Cohen was doing well. No, like, I, I wouldn't have taken Darren Cohen off. When I say start Andy Moore, I would still start Darren Cohen too. I think they're different players. But Cohen's still that finisher. Like, you know, when he gets the chance, he'll put it away. But yeah, yeah I, I just think Mayo was a forward unit weren't doing well. And they needed Andy Moran to come in and change it. Yeah, no, they did. It's actually going to be ha- It would be hard to fit Cohen and Moran and Killian Sullivan into the same forward line because they like to play either one and two inside yeah. or two and two inside. And it's either Moran and Killian. Killian looks to be nailed on because I thought Cohen was doing better than Killian O'Connor. Killian had been uh, beaten out a race or two yeah. to balls. And if you were going to take one of the two of them off, it, w- it would have been Killian O'Connor I, was yeah. going, I would have taken and off. He starts going deeper then looking for it. And maybe that could be. I remember he was playing some lovely passes I forget what game it was last year he was pinging or two years ago pinging him to Andy Moore yeah. and he kept coming out and finding them he's been tried at centre forward yeah that could be a role for him at some stage anyways listen we'll leave it there who are we going to uh, Ryan McHugh I think it'd be hard to give it to anybody else after his performance it was just incredible so Ryan McHugh performance of the weekend congratulations um, even though I say Matty Donnelly Conor Callan <laughs> uh, look to be honest with you and it is a feature and it's only when you look at these um performance of the weekends how all these leaders are standing up I made a joke of it last week that you you could pick this before the weekend started but they are all delivering for their teams the big players the big leaders Um, definitely so Ryan McHugh performance of the weekend um, congratulations so we have a live show in Wexford this Thursday so we'll do a football show on Wednesday um, we're hoping so we'll talk to you then good luck (laughs) 